Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming here in such large numbers for today's conversation. Uh, it's a real privilege, and I'm really excited uh, to be able to welcome all of you to today's discussion uh, as uh, the fifth in the series of the uh, dialogues that we have started since about May this year in partnership with the Trivedi Center for Political Data on Indian Politics. The objective of these dialogues is uh, uh, to bring together uh, observers, journalists, academics, uh, activists, uh, to have a robust, rigorous, and most importantly, nuanced discussion on trends in politics as we run up to 2019. And part of the motivation was that amidst the noise of inevitably what comes in a general election, and amidst the particularly loud noise that we are likely to see in the next few months for this general election, there was an important need to create a space that tried to pass through the noise and engage with some of the most critical issues that are going to shape the elections, potentially shape the outcomes of the elections, and most certainly after the elections, help us understand why things look the way they are. Um, and, and this is to my mind, today's conversation is probably one of the most critical things uh, that, is, uh, that is on everyone's minds uh, as one looks forward to May 2019. I think all politicians are certainly scratching their heads and wondering uh, about uh, what rural India is thinking and how the agrarian moment we are in is going to influence voter choices. But for many of us who are social scientists, people who observe politics um, and are engaged with politics, not as politicians, but as uh, active citizens and observers, we also try to understand what this moment means in and of itself. Um, there, there is something, I think, different and important about the kind of mobilization that we have seen across the country, the kind of protests that we have seen across the country, how that led in some ways to these very important uh, new forms of marches and new forms of mobilization that are hitting all our metropolitans uh, uh, and have been over the last few months and going to continue to uh, 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 going forward. What does all of this mean? Uh, are we seeing a new evolution in agrarian politics? Or is this a culmination of things that have been taking place across the country for, for a while? What is the political message that is going to emerge out of it? What does this mean uh, for the rural-urban uh, divide? Because, of course, the other thing that one always hears about uh, and, and, and observes is that the Indian voter is also changing very rapidly as urbanization is taking place uh, so rapidly. So understanding those implications and perhaps most importantly trying to make sense of the, pol the economy behind this, what is it that has created this particular moment of crises, uh, and how is that uh, going to resolve itself? Is this new politics going to lead to addressing some of the core structural causes uh, of the agrarian crisis that India faces today, and where do we go from here? So I hope that uh, we are going to address some of these questions uh, through today's discussion, and, uh, and I think that in many ways the kind of discussion we have here today is going to be very very critical to how we understand what takes place in our political theater over the next few months. We have with us an absolutely fabulous panel to help us think through some of these questions. Uh, sitting right next to me is Mekla, who is the Associate Professor of Sociology and Social Anthropology at Ashoka University. Mekla has a lot of distinctions to her name, but what makes her being here particularly exciting is because I think she's one of the few uh, people I know who have spent significant amounts of time trying to study agriculture, agricultural markets, and doing so uh, not by creating some fancy econometric models, but really trying to get into the depth of it as an ethnographer. Um, and in many conversations I've had with her, I have learned a lot more about agriculture than I have uh, from anywhere else. Um, uh, uh, we have next to make her Mr. V.M. Singh, who is, I must add, not a Supreme Court lawyer, as he said as soon as we met. Uh, but even more important, he has been at the heart of a lot of the mobilization that we have seen, and, and um, we are all very excited to learn from him. He is the president of the Rashtriya Kisan Mazdoor Party, which is a political formation representing farmers' interests in Uttar Pradesh, and convener of the All India Kisan Sangharsh Coordination Committee, which is a federation of farmers formed, farmer organizations formed in June 2017 in the wake of Maharashtra and, Madhya, and the Madhya Pradesh protests. Um, 
We also have with us uh, Mr. Harish Damodaran, who is the National Editor of Rural Affairs and Agriculture at the Indian Express. If there is one place you need to go to to really understand what's happening in rural India, it's Harish's byline, uh, which I follow regularly and has been one of the most insightful uh, 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 parts. There's a lot that is valuable about the Indian Express, but I learn most reading you. Uh, so it's really exciting for us to have you here uh, and to learn from you, not just about this political, particular political political moment, but uh, what I want to set the stage with in this discussion, which is to give us a little bit of a historical perspective uh, on the evolution of agrarian politics in India, and particularly farmers' movements and farmers' protests. That will, I hope, help us situate what we will talk about uh, through the rest of the afternoon. So over to you, Harish. Thanks, uh, Yamini. It's not a very good idea to ask a journalist about history, but uh, anyway, uh, well, anyway, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll make a few observations. You know, uh, I think that many social movements, you know, I won't say all, but at least quite a lot of uh, social movements are led by social groups who have experienced some kind of upward mobility or even prosperity in the least in, in the recent period. You know, and they sort of develop some kind of a collective consciousness to defend those gain, gains. Like, uh, I believe, for example, you take the Anna Azari movement, you know, it was basically, it was the people who participated were overwhelmingly from a new, a newly empowered urban middle class, you know, very self-righteous, you know, who had benefited from liberalization, you know, IT services, banking, and uh, these people. And uh, somehow the whole rhetoric, you know, of uh, Anna Azari, you know, against politicians, against corruption, somehow they took a shine to it. And, uh, and and uh, and 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 that is how they sort of uh, related to it. So I'll say the same is the case with farmers' movements. Farmers' movements, I don't think, have been led by very poor landless, you know, uh, and uh, those kind of people. It has been led largely by some kind of a middle peasantry, you know, and uh, who have seen some kind of upward mobility in the past. So let us, I mean, I'll, I'll try and uh, see some basic strands, you know. I think in the in the 30s and 40s, you had people like Sir Choturam, you had uh, Nathuram Mirdha, Baldev Mirdha, you had uh, uh, Sahajanan Saraswati in Bihar, uh, 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 and uh, same thing, NG Ranga. You can even extend it to people like YB Chavan and Vasandada Patil, you know. And uh, so, if you look at that, at that time, the main demand was around ownership of land. You know, most of these people were khud khasht. You know, basically, basically they were they were basically cultivated. They were they were cultivating land, and they did not have a right to ownership. So, most of the movements during that period, if you see, were were over uh, the right to ownership. You know, and and and. And uh, it was all around tenancy. Like, like so. If you if you look at, for example, uh, 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 Baldev uh, Ram Mirtha, who I think is a very understudied person during this period, because he comes he, he comes from the Jat community of Rajasthan, you know, and basically the Marwad region. So if you if you see, it was all around the Marwad Tenancy Act, and you know, all these things were during that time. So even if you look at Sir Chotu Ram, it was mostly about you know indebtedness. You know, the fact that the farmer is, uh, he's cultivating land which he unfortunately doesn't own, you know, and, and how to free him from the money lender, you know. So, so the whole thing was around indebtedness. It was, it was around right to ownership, tenancy reforms, etc. And the same was the case even with, uh, with, with, with uh, Sajan and Saraswati. If you look at uh, his, his, uh, his, his, uh, his, uh, his base was largely, you know, where, where people who were, the, the communities were mainly from the Bhumihars, non-landlord Bhumihars, the, the Kurmis, Yadavs, Koris, etc. So this, I think, was the roughly the first phase of uh, farmers' movement. You know, maybe from the 30s to right till maybe maybe the late 40s. You know, early 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 uh, early, early 50s. So you had a lot of land reforms, and these were not uh, redistribution. You know, of land. It was basically a right to ownership, the land to the tiller. It was it was basically that that was I think the first period. This thing. Then I think. The, the, in the in the seventies eighties, I think is the second phase when when you know many of the farmers uh, start uh, you know producing surpluses, and that is the time when you when you find the 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 the, the, the thing changing to you know prices, uh, uh, more crop prices than than uh, power bills, you know, bijli ka bill maaf karna, you know, so it turns uh, around more towards uh, 
those kind of things and that again i think came uh, you know from some kind of prosperity like for example uh, green revolution you know when the green revolution came i mean uh, bm singh comes from that area i mean he knows i think uh, you are from jonti you know or, or one of those uh, areas where where probably you know the yields were maybe you know uh, one ton one and a half tons per hectare and then you're going straight to four tons four and a half tons you know so suddenly there is there is uh, there is some kind of money you know so 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 when you prosper during that period same you can uh, talk even in, about the the maratha sugarcane farmers right so there is money which is which is coming in so so uh, so, so so because of that there, there is there there is a there, there is a different kind of uh, consciousness so when when power rates are increased when irrigation charges are increased then you come to the street so that's what happened to say mahinder singh tikayat and all and uh, Uh, am i running out okay yeah and yeah and, uh, uh, and 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 you also see there is some kind of a caste identity also you know uh, interwoven along with the farmer's uh, identity like the farmer is a jat right or or the you know uh, so these things sort of come together so i i think i think the first two phases we can it is easier to understand you know the 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 land to the tiller and higher prices you know and uh, this thing now we are coming to a third phase which is which is a very interesting phase you know uh, because uh, uh, now 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 the farm the the, uh, the the farmer in the 70s and 80s you know he saw his future in agriculture you know and and uh, so so not only he but his son and everybody would would continue in agriculture so everything was within agriculture you know so so even the demands were very specific to agriculture now actually probably it is now changing you know the farmer uh, yes he calls himself a farmer but he has his, uh, his uh, one feet, one foot in farming and another foot probably trying to go out of farming you know so so you when you see the demands now you know, you know uh, if, if you ask me like the like the like like the maratha movement the patidar movement you know for for reservation it is on it is for reservation in government jobs in in government uh, educational institutions it is for the price of land you know that is if you are going to acquire land from me you better pay me a good price you know so i am trying to so so it is the farming family so so the farming family's income itself is sort of diversified i think recently there was a nabad report which said that only about uh, even in the case of so called farming families only about uh, 43 44% of income comes from farming you know and it doesn't uh, come from uh, uh, and and the rest comes from different uh, uh, so so we are talking of a farmer household you know it is not it is not uh, and a farmer household means it's a very diversified uh, income uh, basket and they are looking at costs other than costs so today you ask any farmer his first complaint when he ask when when you ask him he says ki kharcha bad raha hai lagat bad raha hai but when he is talking of kharcha he is not talking just about fertilizer diesel uh, 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 pesticides seed labor etc he is also talking about education he is also talking about hospitalization you know so so i i think when this whole demand of the swaminathan formula came you know 50% over cost you know instinctively we look at are yaar why do you need 50% return over your cost see because we are used to thinking in terms terms of a firm right a firm a steel company okay yeah so what is your cost cost of iron ore dolomite coal right so therefore ah okay so you should get a 15% return but when we talk of a farmer we have to talk in terms of a farmer family you know because he has other expenses also his expenses are not just he's not going to eat pesticide and uh, and 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 fertilizer he is also talking in terms of his other so then he says okay so if i am getting a 50% return okay then with this i'll be able to educate my son i'll be able to educate my daughter i can i can do so so it is a it is a much more wider demand so i think uh, today what we are coming is in a, is a very interesting kind of a situation where where uh, uh, non farm demands are also being raised you know and the, and the, and the, and farming is just a sort of an identity yes and and everybody says uh, i am a kisan ka beta you know so that is more a sort of an uh, uh, it, it is it need not be an occupation per se you know but 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 they are but farmers are very clear that what they want is not just a return over uh, this thing so i would say that these are broadly the three phases if we can look at it from a historical uh, perspective yeah. thank you so in a sense you're sort of characterizing today's moment as 
the sort of aspirational farmer that in some ways is different to uh, uh, to the past and in a, in a sense we can't look at this completely in isolation of all the other new forms of mobilization that are taking place uh, across the country uh, we am seeing your reaction to that and and how would you characterize this particular uh, uh, th th this particular protest and also if i could trouble you to give us little more insights into how the protests themselves have evolved uh, over time in the last few years i must tell you something farmers in this country today are not treated well at all they look down upon we all had our lunch a little while ago tell me how many of us even thought of the farmer who got the bread on the table humne paisa de diya and that's the end of it who even cares that three and a half lakh farmers in the last 15 years have committed suicide they were earning your bread producing your bread and they couldn't even manage a morsel for themselves we have to give a thought for the farmers primarily times have changed as harish said in the 80s when he talked about jonthi village is ahead of jonthi village is a village called punjab khod that is where the green revolution came from and that's my village my uncle at that point in time was president nixon's guest in 67 68 went to 27 other countries i did my schooling for modern barakhamba from shiram did my prelims my parents told me laat tod denge agar ias ki taraf dekha to today har aadmi kehta hai मैं किसान का बेटा हूं इस देश में एक आदमी तो दिखा दो जो बोलता है कि मेरा बेटा खेती करता है द सेकेंड जनरेशन इज नॉट इन टू फार्मिंग एंड आई आई से मेरा थॉट फॉर द फार्मर्स इट्स नॉट अ मैटर कि खेती करता है या नहीं करता है अगर किसान खेती नहीं करेगा तो खाना कहां से आएगा हाई सी से कितना लेके आओगे खाना what is the quantum that you can take from the high seas whether it's wheat or it's rice we only do politics here and politics at the expense of the next generation which is getting no jobs what are we leaving for them whether it's a party or b party or c party or d party they all the same when it comes to votes we'll give you everything and after realizing their own ambitions they don't even talk about it this is where the nation has to respect the people that feed the nation which is not happening i am totally with harish when he gave the history yes there was one man that you missed out harish jyoti bai phule he was a strong farming leader and so was sardar patel the bardoli andolan how do we forget that but as you said very correctly at that point in time the whole business centered around land today what is it it centers around the cultivators are they going to be cultivators or are they going to have ambanis and adanis having tens of thousands of acres and the same people who own the land today are going to be just sitting there and doing something or the other on a paltry salary this is the question that the nation must take up today and for that what we have done i have a sangathan rashtriya kisan mazdoor sangathan i became a mla in 1993 from uttar pradesh i took up these causes you have to pay a price no free lunches are there as you know first cause i took up was the sugarcane farmers short weightage the farmer grows sugarcane after one year he takes his produce there to the mill to the sugarcane weighing scale and 10% 15% are whacked because somebody is just readjusting it i got that settled i got the settled immediately what happens is all the mills in uttar pradesh 119 of them at that point in time they went on a strike arrest vm singh or else we will shut down operations lot of these things have happened we have come a long way i took refuge of the supreme court and the high court at that point in time i am not a lawyer i haven't done law 
But believe you me, please Google it out. Ask a lawyer friend. There is not one case that we have lost in the Supreme Court or the High Court to date, in spite of the fact that Mr. Nariman, Mr. Venugopal, Mr. Shanti Bhushan, Harish Salve, Mukul, Arun Jaitley, etc., all stand in one line against the farmers. Don't they eat the food that the farmers grow? Why should it be VM Singh on one side and all the other them on the other side? We don't care a damn for the farmers. We have to change the attitude. So what we did was, every Sangatan organization came around fighting for the farmers. My organization is bigger than yours. Yours is bigger than mine. In Maharashtra last year, they had uh, agitation, said, okay, when Mr. Modi said, Sapka Saath, Sapka Vikas, I'm for everyone. And the loans will be waived. So please waive our loans. The chief minister, knowing fully well he's not going to do a damn, he waived it. He made an announcement. Not in the cabinet, no budgetary allocations, but made an announcement. Poor chaps in Madhya Pradesh, they followed suit. And what did they get? Six bullets. Six farmers were, five were shot dead, and the sixth one, uh, Ganshan, he was taken to the police station, beaten so badly that he died there and then. And the five people who died, they was on Abhishek Patidar, who was 17 years old. He was only assisting his father when he had come for holidays or whatever. Then I gave a call to everyone. In between, if you remember, Ayukannu of Tamil Nadu had come to Delhi, drew the attention of the country. Nobody would even write about him. So they did all the wrong things, eating rats, doing whatever they could there on Jantar Mantra to attract attention. Is that the farmer? This is what the farmer is left to. To draw attention to your state, what you're going through, if you do all that. Then we all got together at Gandhi Peace Foundation on 16th of June after Mansoor and said, let's get together. Individually, we'll all crack down. The government will just push us. We won't even know where we've gone. Let's get together. We were 100 of us that time. And today we are a strong 203 organizations all in one Akhil Bhartiya Kisan Sangha Samanwe Samiti or All India Kisan Coordination Committee. What is the result? This is a long march. I mean, as I said, 25 years ago I started all this. And not me. There are plenty of people who started even before that. And there are plenty of people who started after me. But we've consolidated all that now. The result is the same Narendra Bhai Modi, who in the year 2014, in the elections, went all over town in almost 309 meetings, if I'm not wrong, in my number. He said, I will ensure that the Swaminathan Commission report, which guarantees you one and a half times the production cost is given to the farmers, which the Congress did not give for seven and a half years, I will do it. He said that. We believed in the man. We said, I have never supported the BJP before this. My entire Sangatan, the other Sangatan today, which is with the BJP, which is coming today on a walk, they all su supported the Congress, and they supported the Congress openly. Mr. Takayat Sangatan, every other Sangatan. We supported the BJP outright, because General Vika Singh at one point in time also was part of our Sangatan after retirement. We supported them. What did we get? In 2015, Mr. Narendra Modi gives an affidavit in the Supreme Court. My government shall not be able to give one and a half times the production cost. Very well. After Mansoor, when we had a rally last year, about 2,000 people, uh, 200,000 people came to Delhi, with some people, 300,000, maybe even if there were 100,000. They came to Delhi on 20th and 21st of November. This was after going through the entire country, length and breadth, 10,000 kilometers out by road, flights, whether it's Assam, whether it's Jammu Kashmir, whether it is Kanyakumari, everywhere. We went all over. We have a coordination committee. We went all over. About 500 meetings. We came to Delhi. We decided, are we only going to live off announcements? This party said this. This party has gone out. This new party has come in. Now again get an announcement from them. No, we won't do that. We said, we have to get bills in the parliament. Legislation in the parliament. 
It's a new thing totally from farming organizations that they've done before. We are not going to take it lying down now because the next generation, we don't have jobs for them. We, know, we have no jobs for them. We have no direction for them now. And what are they doing? Depression or crime? We are leaving them nowhere else. So we said, very fine. We got together. We had a parliament session at Jantar Mantar. Defining farmers again. What are farmers? Women who do the bulk of the farming job in the rural areas. As you all know, 85% people are within the bracket of two hectares. It is their women that look after the cattle. And cattle milk is one thing that takes the farmer's family along. So we said we'll have a parliament, Medha Patkar's part of our Sangatan. We made her the speaker, being the convener, we did that. And we had four, uh, 543 parliamentarians there, and who were there? All women, and women who lost their husbands, father, or son due to suicide. We got them across. And they told the nation, now that we are one, don't commit suicide. We know what it's all about. We'll fight it out. And that's what we're doing. Then after that, we placed two bills before the parliament, the, the mock parliament, as you say, the Kisan parliament. Then we called the political parties, 21 political parties. This has never happened in the history of the country earlier. So your history has to include this also, Harish. So we got 21 political parties at Constitution Club. We gave them the bills. There are two bills. Firstly, Sabko Kazze Se Mukti Do, not waiver, not mafi. We are talking about a right. How can a waiver ever be a right? You will probably say. I'll tell you how. You have to give me about two, three minutes more, just in case it's there. Yeah. How can waiver ever be a right? And secondly, because Swaminathan report says one and a half times of the production cost, which is comprehensive cost called C2, please give that. We made these bills, placed it before them, and Mr. Sharad Pawar, everyone was there. Mr. Khadge was there from the Congress. Mr. Sharad Pawar was there. Mr. Farooq Abdullah was there. Mamta Banerjee was coming. She didn't come. Dinesh Trivedi was there all the while. Sita Ramichuri was there. You name it and everyone was there. And the best is CPM one side, Mamta Banerjee's party the other side. Shiv Sena one side, Sharad Pawar one side. We talk about the unity, Operation Unity. After Karnataka, this happened in May. It happened with the farmers. We did that. PDP on one side, YRS on the other side. We got all of them together, 21 parties in the political setup in the parliament. We were the ones who got them together on our bills. They said, yes, we will support them. They signed a resolution. I have a resolution in the car. I don't know. I, I, I didn't get it wrong here. And they signed the resolution saying that we will support these bills in the parliament. Then some of them said we want to make some changes. We sat in. We made changes. And... Now the bills are in the parliament. On 3rd of August 2018, they were placed in the parliament and accepted in the parliament for discussion. We went to the president of India. I told him, I said, sir, this is an agrarian society. And to pass a GST legislation, you can have a midnight session of parliament. When three and a half lakh farmers have died and we placed two bills, why can't you have a special session of parliament to, you know, to support the bills? He said, yes, it should be done. But it's not been done. And now we, what we are doing as such is we, we need everyone's support. There are some friends who got together and made a nation for farmers. They've got various chapters, journalists for farmers, advocates for farmers, etc., etc. And we are trying to hold a rally in Delhi on 28th of November, 29th of November, 30th of November, two days, long march from all sides, and 30th will be a main rally in Delhi, where twice or thrice the people that came in last time are going to come. And tell Mr. Modi, Mr. Modi, you promised something, you're going, please do it. We won't take it lying down. We need your support there. But before I finish, I want to just tell you two things. What are the two bills? And why do I say it's a matter of right? How can waiver be a matter of right? Piaas tomatoes ka rate badta hai. You have the government's changing. You have the DNS allowance coming in. 
the pay commissions take over every 10 years, not every 5 years, and they say, yes, you have to get this from the recommended date. And if the recommended date goes away, then what happens? Areas, am I right? They get areas. This last eight and a half months of areas were given right now in the seventh pay commission. Now in Swaminathan, the recommended date was 15th of August 2007. That had to be done. Mr. Modi says, Hamne kar diya. Somebody says what? We say, what you have done is exactly what Mr. Manmohan Singh had done. The formula is the same. He did for wheat, you've done for paddy. Not comprehensive. Comprehensive means the take of the land, the rent of the land also must come in. Depreciation of machinery also must come in. So please do that. Let farming become a profitable preparation again. So this is what we have done there. And now what we say as such is, why am I going to write? If in 2007 this was implemented, we would have got 50% more on the C2. What loan I have to give you today, you are going to give me at least 10 times more than that. Let's call it quits. Na aap do, na hum de, hume mukt karo, kheti ko zinda honne ke liye raasta kholo. That's why we say, mukti do, indebtedness se hume, number one. Number two, one and a half time if you don't give us, then we'll fall into the trap again next year. We don't want that. There's insurance, pension, lot of other things to come. But these are the basics. And this is what we say, if the parliament passes it, then if this agrarian society or the country will probably see the light of the day again. Next generation, believe you, this generation is not interested in farming. And after that, people will not know what farming is all about. So therefore, I appeal to everyone around, I appeal to the nation through you, that we need to support ourselves, help ourselves by helping the farmers to sustain agriculture and get the youth into a direction where they can do something in life. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was uh, absolutely fascinating and I think uh, very, very insightful to understand uh, both the evolution of the movement as they are uh, as they are emerging today as well as some of the key issues that have uh, been uh, at the forefront of this. But I think one important thread that is coming both when we look at it from a historical perspective and from understanding uh, 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 the perspective you've just given us uh, is that in a sense we are also at a very at a, at a very important moment of structural transformation and the sort of you describe it as a redefinition of the of who a farmer is uh, you know uh, you also talk about the farmers aspirations going it's not more, it's not just about the tools to be able to be a better farmer but it's also um, uh, there's a whole other set of aspirations and, and needs that are emerging into this dialogue and conversation. And there's also this sort of urban transition that India is, take, is underweighing. And I think somewhere perhaps a notion that uh, the, 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 the core youth voter is coming from urban India and not necessarily from rural India, that might also be creating some of the political tensions that we're seeing. I do want to go into the economics of it, uh, but, can, but Mekha, can we start with with first just talking about the structural transformation as it's unfolding and its politics before we get into uh, 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 the economic story, which is, of course, linked to the politics. So. Uh, thank you. I mean, I just want to start by saying that I grew up in Bombay. Uh, and, uh, you know, well before I <coughs> found my way to Mandi's. And I don't think for my family, for the people who went to school with me, there has been a moment like that long march. I think for, you know, to see a city like Bombay, is actually, it, it really, I think, had it connected with so many people. And the city was transformed for that day and for that period. Uh, and there were very deep solidarities, um, I think, that were forged in that moment. And, you know, as I'd been working on agriculture for a decade before that, but I don't think anybody actually understood, even amongst my, you know, immediate circle, what it had meant. Um, so I think this achievement of bringing so many farmers, um, organizations together, and also, you know, really, I mean, I don't think there's been a moment where we've actually known on a common basis, A2 plus FL, what C2 actually yeah. means. Yeah. You know, there was a BPL debate between Tendulkar Committee report, and these are terms that we got familiar with at some point. But in all my years of studying agriculture, the number of people who say, Acha, explain what is this A2 plus FL thing, right? People who are not working on agriculture who will ask me to explain. It's quite extraordinary that, that we have come to a point 
where that is the kind of discourse that is taking place in cities like Bombay uh, and Delhi. So I think that that is, you know, something that's quite uh, remarkable at this moment. I, I want to actually just taking off from Yamini, but also from both of your comments, um, maybe suggest a slightly different understanding and potentially one which might see possibilities of different kinds of politics as well. Right. Um, I mean, Hadith, you, you know, you were giving us a sense of the um, emergence of the movements and the evolution of the movements, particularly in the 70s and 80s. And it was really the India versus Bharat articulation. Uh, it was a rural versus urban articulation. Uh, it was producer versus consumer articulation. Although we know our PDS system and procurement is deeply about both the producer and the consumer in the way in which it has developed in India in a rather unique manner. But those have always been put against each other. In fact, most of the conversation in the previous uh, regime in UP was about inflation. Right? It was a period of rising prices as well. And in that early period, there were all sorts of concerns. Uh, even this government from time to time, when sewer prices go up, it becomes an urban issue. You know, many times people have said the price of onions will bring down a government. And that is not the low price of government uh, of onions, but actually the high price, thinking about a middle class consumer. So th those polarities have been set up. right? But we know historically across India, um, the rural has always been more than agriculture. Um, and we also have known historically that agriculture has always been more than the rural. Right? The urban has been a very important part of the agrarian story. You know, the historian David Ludden often says, for a long time, urbanization actually happened within agriculture. Right? These small market towns, the, even the larger towns, were important from an agricultural point of view. Um, and I actually think, at least from my research in places like Madhya Pradesh and now in Odisha and Bihar and Punjab, you're actually seeing far more connection. Right? Uh, this initial story that we've heard now for 10, 15 years, particularly sociologists have taken this, you know, strong, one strand of sociology that there's no future left in the village, right? That the village is actually being hollowed out um, and that it is withering and that everything is actually centered towards an urban imagination. Um, you know, for me, I am not, that's not the only story of the relationship between the rural and the urban that I'm seeing. I'm actually seeing a more complex story. And actually, Harish, in your own book, I think, you know, we know that diversification from agriculture has always come both from distress. So it's been a distress-driven diversification. But there has also been a surplus sustained diversification. I mean, you have pl plotted farmers' various trajectories from agrarian um, sort of surplus to both industrial as well as other forms of engagement in the Indian economy, right? Whether that's cooperative capitalists or other forms. So the surplus has been a very important thing. And you mentioned that also in the, the movements, because that led, I mean, in the 80s as well. So I wouldn't say education has become important for farmers today. For the farmers in the 1980s and uh, 90s, um, the Green Revolution farmers, um, education was very important form of surplus investment even then. And in fact, this increasing challenge we have, the structural challenge we have of growth without employment is that we are seeing a lot of previously agrarian families and those who are still, you know, very much tied to agriculture, educating themselves, coming out looking for jobs and unable to find them. So that is this problem of educated unemployment, which has actually been financed by agrarian surpluses. They continue to be financed by agrarian surpluses. I have friends who live in cities whose fees are still paid in part by what is happening in the rural area. I know families in the town that I work in, in Harda, who, you know, send their children to school in the town on the backs of still what they're earning from the farm. So agriculture still in, in many parts of India continues to fuel and then is also, of course, dependent on remittances coming from uh, the city as well. But also you see that many of these people have two, two identities. I mean, when I did a little bit of field work in Dadri Mandi um, in you know, because I was at that time at Shivnara University and it was just outside our university campus, um, all the laborers were farmers from Bihar, right, who came for the season but went back to farm. Um, and so they were still farmers. I think one of the things NREGA pointed out to us in a very dramatic way was that, you know, over 40, 50 percent of the people actively seeking NREGA were farmers, were small farmers looking to actually improve their farmland. 
right? So these kinds of things are more complex than we are necessarily when we polarize them into an, you know, uh, a futureless village or a futureless agriculture, which I absolutely agree needs urgent attention. And it is a very live and desperate fight. Uh, but at the same time, I just want to point out these very interesting linkages. Uh, Hadda, the town I worked in, the town of 75,000 people, um, over the last 40 years, when I talked to people about the transformation, they would often say, uh, Harda was a village of townsmen. Right? It was a village basically of banyas, of traders, of artyas, and of um, adhikaris. So from a village of townsmen, they say, we are now a town of villagers. Everybody has live relationships with agricultural homes. Right? And I think this really challenges our understanding of who is urban and who is rural. And, you know, we have this, I think that is definitely true that many young people from second generation farming families who are moving to cities, they all like their mobile phones. There's no doubt about that. They all have urban aspirations. Many of them will talk about certain kinds of jobs and other things. But they not only have an understanding of agriculture, they still retain a stake in it. I have had with so many urban young people very detailed conversations about what is going on in their farm. So you're quite right that they don't want to be farmers necessarily, but that they are not disconnected either. To me, this is actually a moment of opportunity. It's a moment to think about what this kind of interlinkage might mean. From a political point of view, I think it really complicates who we think is an urban voter and a rural voter, who has agrarian links and agrarian investments and even agrarian dreams, but maybe in an urban context. Um, it also potentially makes us think differently about economic opportunity and the structures of those opportunities and the ways in which we can think of these households as much more um, complicated you know, than in a binary fashion. So, to me, this is actually quite an interesting time. I'm not sure that political parties, I think movements have understood this in a very profound way. I think, again, the relationship between Khet or Mazdood, and you know, the Kisan and the Mazdood, the relationship between all the others who are also dependent on agriculture, who actually traverse both rural village spaces and urban spaces. And here I'm going to somewhat controversially include actually traders and vendors and all the others who people, again, usually pit against farmers, but are actually part of an agrarian economy and who are deeply invested in the future of agriculture. So I think um, there is this moment of thinking about what these interlinkages could mean. And I actually think that this is somewhere where both our political parties um, you know, don't pay enough attention. And I think our movements and academics, we must actually be much more attuned to this. I just wanted to add a small thing. You know, uh, Sudhir Kumar was an anthropo uh, sociologist and political scientist in JNU. You know, he pointed out in an EPW paper very interestingly that a number of the farmers showing up at these protests were also very disheartened and disenchanted with the urban. Because this is not a new experience now. People have been here for several years. They've also experienced the, you know, the dejection and disappointment of not having jobs, but they've also experienced indignity. Um, and so there's also a different imagination that he was beginning to hear of what the rural might be. This is, of course, not everywhere. It sits side by side with a very large proportion who say they want to exit agriculture. So let's not make it that there's no contradiction here. But I think this is a really interesting thing that he's pointed out, right? Vijay Bhaskar, again, in an EPW article, makes this interesting point about uh, South Indian farmers that many of the urban, you know, and uh, young farmers want to go back. Now, a small number. Again, it's not the vast number. It's not like they're going back to a good future. It's a terribly difficult thing. But the fact that they're beginning to, whether because they have no opportunities here, Right, whether because they're being mobilized in a certain way to actually own and imagine a thing. So I actually think this is a you know a, a moment to think through. So just to lead to this next part, and you know, and again, Harish, to pick back on your thing, um, you know, one of the things, and I actually completely understand why both the loan waiver and indebtedness and prices are so vital to the battle at the moment. And as you put it, it is a battle for survival, right? But at the same time, one of the remarkable things, Harish, from the 70s and 80s is that the demands haven't changed all that much from a farmer's movement point of view. What the farmer is demanding is much more, right? He's looking for an urban future. He's looking for other kinds of employment. He's looking for other kinds of engagement too, um, different ways of thinking about land. But 
the movements themselves, right? The things that come to the fore are land rights in certain very key places. That was a major part of the Maharashtra ma march and other places too. I think land is still an important issue, uh, particularly for sharecroppers and those who are not able to access various things, Adivasi farmers for sure, the uh, implementation of FRA and uh, PESA. Um, but MSP is the primary thing we hear. And uh, the second, you know, thing is the, the loan waiver, which is again a very, it takes up all the mind space. Now, I, I mean, I just feel like in some ways, given the power of this moment, given that there is a spotlight on agriculture, given that there is this possible interlinkage between the rural and the urban potentially, I wish we could now also use this space, right, to make or to think about the larger, deeper structural issues in agriculture that need to be addressed with much more sustained public investment and a whole different imagination in a sense of what should be the future of agriculture. Um, and I'm, actually I would love to hear from both of you about it, but I'll just give a small example with MSP, for example. Um, I mean, I was, I have watched the Madhya Pradesh story of wheat procurement unfold over the last 10 years, so I can, I know what it's like to actually do procurement and how it can work. Uh, it has also had other implications, and we can talk about that as well, but it is an example of procurement that has worked and predates this. In Odisha, I've been exploring the way in which paddy procurement in certain parts of Odisha is actually fairly successful and interesting. Uh, but we know for the vast number of farmers, it is not a reality. And now we are trying to experiment with different kinds of uh, methods to reach you know, price support, uh, but we know exactly how difficult this issue is. Right? And the problem with MSP is it takes away the conversation from marketing reforms um, beyond APMC reform. And with this is left as some vague thing called APMC reforms. Now, we know how difficult, how regionally specific, how complex Indian agricultural commodity markets are. If we don't open up the space to start talking about the challenges in a much more fine-grained and detailed manner, if we don't provide the public f finance and support required for mandis, for things, I mean, I'll just give you the example of ENAM, um, you know, the E-National Agricultural Markets, which is again in the news so very much. Um, even if we were to assume it was succeeding in pilots, and we know that there is, you know, significant implementation issues and few successes, um, it covers 585 mandis in the pilot phase, which of the regulated mandis that exist, which are 7,500 odd, which are far fewer than the number we actually need, is 8%. And within each of those mandis, they are covering one crop, one commodity alone. And they are not even succeeding at that level. We are not talking about the number of mandis we actually require to function in these places. We, you know, we have spent the last decade trying to dismantle the mandi system and say that that was the only direction. Now we are reinvesting in the mandi system, but without paying attention to the actual dynamics of that kind of reform. So in a sense, I think this is also an opportunity to highlight some of the key issues um, and to fight for things like the MSP, which I think has been a lifeline for many farmers. Uh, but also to extend our imagination and our demands uh, in a direction where they really take the systemic challenges of agriculture seriously so that it is not just for one year that farmers get relief or two years that they, that they get relief with an MSP, but that we actually transform, therefore, you know, what is the future potential of Indian farming in a very location-specific regional way. I have some more ideas, but I'll let everybody speak and come back. <laughs> Thank you, Mekla. That was fascinating, and, and uh, you've kind of done my job for me by setting up the, the, the next phase of the conversation. But I did want to just pose to both of you uh, uh, to sort of react to some of the very interesting things that Mekla was talking about. One is sort of giving us a more granular understanding of uh, the character of the farmer today. Uh, I think this sort of, you know, it's, it's very easy to think about India in binaries, and we tend to do that. I think our politics also pushes us in that direction. But these interconnectednesses of the r rural and urban, and what does what that does to the experiences, and therefore the kind of political demands that are emerging out of it. I think that's a that's that's something that uh, uh, we'd all like to learn a little bit more from. Um, but also, what does that mean then from the perspective of party politics? You know, are 
is party politics just completely missing the nub here uh, or uh, are they purposefully choosing not to engage with it because it is so complex? Um, you know, j just some thoughts on that. And then, of course, to the larger question that Mekla is posing, which is how does one take this political moment and translate it into a new articulation of what's, what, what agricultural reform should look like going forward? So, very well. See, firstly, as I said, party politics has let us down very badly. All the parties, irrespective of where they come from, there is no Kisan for them. It's only caste-based, religion-based. Either you're a Jat, Gujar, Saini, Tyagi, Brahmin, Thakur, Kurmi, now it's only Muslim or Sikh. You're not a Kisan. We are getting back Jat Baradi Chhodke Kisan Baradri Mein Wapis Hao. That was the initial thing. You know, there were no debts that people had earlier. If you went into somebody's family, taking your bhuvas, shagan, or your daughter's thing, etc., for a marriage, and you got to know that somebody was in debt, you would take back and say, no, I'm not giving my girl there or my aunt there because they are in debt. Today, every single farmer in the country is under debt. Kisan credit card, whichever party it is, Kisan credit card is the worst thing that could ever happen to the farmers. Yes, I'm sure you, quite a lot of people are shocked on that. I can't return my old past payment of, or, you know, on the credit card. I'm hiding somewhere. The bank manager calls me and says, hold it. Don't worry, I'll give you more. I'll even churn out your money with the suspense account, take 2%. You have to return the money to get enhanced money. He does it all mixing up. Please check up the rural areas. It's very clear. They take 2% and they just make your account into a regular account and give you more. And what more do we want? Look at any budget. Look at the magnanimity for all these parties. Eight and a half lakh crores out of a union budget of 19 lakh crores for the farmers when UPA left. Harish, just correct me if I'm wrong. Eight and a half lakhs out of 19 lakhs for the farmers. What is that for? Kisan credit card loans. They anticipate that you will not get the minimum support price. If rice or paddy, the minimum support price last year was 1550 rupees, it was sold in the market for 1000 rupees. If soya bean, from where you come from, Hadda, Timurni and all that area, Hashangabad area, if soya bean was 1900 rupees, it was 3300 rupees, it was being sold for 1800 rupees. So to cut all this off, in our bills we've also got another thing, that minimum support price, you can't change the definition of minimum. Minimum is minimum. Nobody can sell or purchase for less than that in the country. If anybody does that, put them behind bars, and this is the order I got from the UP High Court, Allahabad High Court in, 19, uh, in 2000, 9th of November 2000, a lot of traders went to jail. Now I say, a lot of people will say on that account, I'm drifting from there though, a lot of people would say, what happens to the poor? You want a higher MSP? You want the MSP to be implemented also? Your wheat is going to be 26 rupees, 27 rupees per kg? The flour is going to be about 35 rupees. How does the poor man eat? This is a legislation we proposed. There's already a legislation there. Food Security Act. Which says for one rupee or two rupees, give it to the poor. Only if you buy it for them, then you'll procure from us. If the PDS system finishes, collapses, why do you buy from us? We are also trying to extend that. It should be extended to the farmers who've got less than five acres of land. That one rupee, two rupee system. So therefore, if the government is to procure 50% of the grains in the country, and not just 24 crops that they're doing right now, for all the crops, including milk, are you aware of the fact? Cow milk, a farmer spends about 28 to 30 rupees to raise one liter of milk. He's getting 23 rupees at some places, 24 rupees at some places. All what the farmer is living, if I can say in Hindi, Udhar ki zindagi jira hai. That is why the suicides. 
What he does is from one bank he gets the NOC. He gets the NOC from one bank that there are no loans. Takes the loan from the other bank. This is a fraud. Beti ki shadi karni hai, takes the NOC again. Many farmers have taken loans on the same land from four, five banks. Ultimately, when they all pounce on him and say, please return it, he has no choice but to commit suicide. This is one thing as such, you know. And party politics, as I said, is dirty. Therefore, we all want today that the next election should be Kisan or Naujawan. Naujawan ko agar naukri dena hai, Naujawan ko rasta dikhana hai, to kheti ko zinda karna padega, kisi ke paas dam nahi hai is desh ke andar, ke aap ko 10 karoor naukri de de. They can say what they like. I'll give you one small example. In UP, I'm called the sugarcane man, as the, uh, if you know. All these things, you know, for sugarcane farmers, for the, the rate has come in my petitions, the payments are made in my petition. Just day before yesterday, so the, the High Court has pulled up the principal secretary for not giving the money along with interest. All these things. But 50 lakh families depend on sugarcane in UP alone, and 5 crore in the whole country. 50 lakh in UP. If every one man comes back to farm on a sugarcane crop, uh, on a sugarcane field, 50 lakh jobs will be there immediately. And that can be done and that shall be done. Once we have the conviction, if sugar today, if cane is purchased and we get the payment within 14 days, why should we not get the payment for two years? If these politicians, when they come to power, they say we'll give it in 14 days, that the act says, and later they say, don't grow sugar cane. It's said diabetes hota hai. You heard that. <coughs> Pakistan se chini aati hai, wo sugar free hai. Abhi aap leke aai na, Pakistan se chini. Chowan lakh metric ton, wo sugar free hai. Aap naat, naat na jane aangan teda. Kuch kar nahi paate aap, aap kehte ho sugar hi mat lagao, ganna mat lagao. What happens to all those areas with the flood affected? We have so many rivers there. My constituency is Pili Bheed, Lakhimpur Khiri, Pili Bheed, right up to Rampur and everywhere. This side, Sharda, that side, Ganga, Yamuna, all these sides. You can't grow anything else. What are you talking from the back of the heads? It's our fault. It's the farmer's fault. We elect such people who don't know anything about farming. That is why the change now in the party politics. Ya hamari baat karo, ya jao. We have a lot of people who can stand up today. And we can face the parliament, we can face the president, we can face the courts, we can face everything around and say, and I've told you, I fight in the Supreme Court, I've got a lot of orders, the, the rates of sugarcane in the entire country today are given on my petition, which I won from the Supreme Court, five judges bench in 2004, against all these people. They said the state has no power, I got that the state has a power. Remember, they, they didn't get the money for one year, etc., etc. So we all have the capacity today to fight it out for our rights. And we are going to do that. And my only thing as such is, when we talk about the MSP, let me tell you, MSP is not our lifeline. It's become a necessity now. Earlier what was happening was, uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm coming to it because what you said that. Earlier in 1965, when Agriculture Price Commission Production Commission or a Price Commission, it was a Price Commission that time and came in. There was nothing called MSP. As Harish said, there was no excess. We would see whatever we have taken to produce it, keep our markup and sell it. Then came in the quota system, the PDS system, the levy system, if you remember. You have to give it in levy. That came in a stage where farmers were taken for a ride. They needed protection. In 2000, the National Agriculture Policy 2000 specifically earmarked a guarantee to the farmers that they will not be selling it for less than the minimum support price. That's a 2000 policy under Atal Bari Bachwai, much later. And that is where I went to court on that and said, this is a guarantee. I'm very happy that Maharashtra, 20 days ago, has accepted our one condition in the bill in the parliament which says, that no trader will buy for less than the MSP. If he does, he will be jailed and he will be penalized 1 lakh rupees. They started on this. It has to be done to save the farmer. And what you do is, 
all the people, 60 percent people below the poverty line, you can say they only 20 percent, but actually about 60 percent people are in that category, including small farmers. Please give them at one rupee, two rupees. If you give them there, you'll buy from us. Today, you want to finish PDS? These are aspects that are very, very alarming. And I just want to tell you one thing on C2, a small little thing on C2. A2 is the production cost. FL is family labor. So earlier it was only production cost. The farmer, his wife, his children, their wages were not taken into account. FL took that into account. And that was done in the year 2008 when Manmohan Singh had raised wheat, wheat price by 215 rupees a quintal. It's not for the first time it's raised by 200 rupees. Then came in C2. And why I stress on C2 is not because of Swaminathan alone. In my own case, in 2006, in the High Court in Allahabad that was upheld by the Supreme Court here in 2013, we have already got the rental value and depreciation of the equipment used for the farm. Rental value of the land and equipment use. We already got that in that case. We only got 13, 14% more than that. But if you want him to have a decent life, 50% you want to give it. So if it comes to 50% on sugarcane, the rate according to the production rate is 280 rupees in UP. According to the research centers, which is produced in the court, every year we go to the court, 50% more than that is 420, 425. If a farmer gets 425 rupees a quintal, we have a new variety that's come in, Combo 238, which gives you about 400 to 500 quintals. If a farmer can get 1 lakh rupees an acre, believe you me, his sons will never go begging for jobs. So that's what I wanted. 50 lakh people go there. In the country, you get about 5 crore jobs. It will make a difference. These people, party or no party, we are going to stand on our own two feet. This is our country. We will make agriculture a success here. Thanks. Harish, it will be great to bring you in uh, both on the sort of uh, the political party story, but also a little more on the, uh, on the economics and the reform uh, question in terms of how does one sort of now also move this moment towards thinking more seriously about some of the deeper agricultural reform questions. Yeah, I think uh, Mekla raised about the I mean, raised the point about agriculture and non-agriculture. The fact that these are connected. Uh, see, if you go to Tamil Nadu, for example, you know, many of the small industries, the SMEs, have been actually built by farmers. You know, and this is not just uh, Tirupur. Tirupur, we know, you know, about the, about the netware and all. You go to a place like say Karur. You know, Karur, you have this bus body building. It's all done mostly by farmers, uh, uh, farming families. Same thing, you go to Tirichangot. Tirichangot is a center where, where they make these, uh, where, 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 where they do these uh, borewell rigs, you know, and these, uh, and these farmers, they carry their borewell rigs on their trucks all the way to Rajasthan and to, to Madhya Pradesh and to all these uh, places. Same thing, uh, if, you, if you look at, for example, Namakal, the entire transport industry, you know, the, 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 the big transport carriers, these have all been built by basically by farmers' children. Same, uh, you look at, for example, in Saurashtra, you look at Amreli, the Amreli or the Surat, the, the, the diamond cutting industry. Uh, Morbi, you look at, the, uh, you, you, you look at the, the ceramic tile industry. So basically, you had this transition from agriculture to non-agriculture, you know, the, 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 basically, basically some kind of a transport industry, manufacturing, and those kind of things. See, and, and what is, and, and the other thing which is, which is very important is, see, look, I mean, today we cannot say that farmers' costs means only fertilizer, mm -hmm. pesticide, and these things. You have to include education, and education means private education. You know, many of these Maratha young boys and girls who are there, they've all gone to, you know, private engineering colleges, you know, not medical out of question, you you forget, it's not, I mean, they, they cannot. So you will have to treat these as expenses, you know, the, the, the thing. As, as I said, I mean, if, if I'm Tata Steel or I'm, in, I'm Jindal Steel, I only have to look at, you know, how much is the, what is my total cost? And then I, I take a 
profit and maybe whatever return to my shareholders whereas here you are talking of an entire family's income you know and and which and that income is not going to be spent just on pesticide and uh, fertilizer but also on 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 private education on uh, on on other opportunities so which means you need to think in terms of even diversification of the farmers uh, you know for the farming families income you know maybe maybe one actually even in the earlier times you know like we know that all our jawans are nothing but uh, you know kisans uh, 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 sons right i mean the soldier is nothing but the peasant in uniform kind of a thing so so it was always a diversified household but now the need for diversification is even more you know so so we cannot just think in terms of crop you know pricing those things definitely yes pricing has to incorporate costs more comprehensive now whether you call it a2 plus fl or c2 you know what what are the elements but definitely there has to be some kind of uh, 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 we, we need to introduce these things and how do you provide it you know is it by direct procurement or do you make uh, uh, sort of uh, transfers you know maybe whatever you know rupees per per acre kind of a thing because uh, because because if you raise say for example sugar prices i mean because your sugar cane prices goes up and sugar prices go up to say 60 rupees then 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 where do we compete internationally you know these the, these are aspects because the fact is we are moving into surpluses and we need to seriously start thinking in terms of exports like i i personally believe that we can easily export 100 billion dollar worth of agricultural produce you know we we moved from about 5 billion dollars to 43 billion dollars in 10 years i feel, i i believe we can do it you know we can go to 100 billion dollars and and if you want to reduce your trade deficit and all i mean i think agriculture is definitely one uh, uh, one area and i believe that india has both uh, both comparative as well as absolute advantage in agriculture you know so we have to think in those terms and farmers have to be compensated in that way and at the same time we should be able to take away farmers some farmers away from the from the land you know and so that so that the farmer who is interested you know he he or she is 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 uh, incentivized to produce you know uh, to to go and maybe here there is lot of role for 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 technology you know digitization the the the, the farmers i meet nowadays they are much smarter than what they were about two generation three generations back many many farmers i know who do who do land leveling the many farmers you if you go to maharashtra and all they do raised bed cultivation you know the they, they use they use drip irrigation and i think that is the that is what i mean we should move to a situation where farming doesn't become an occupation by default but it becomes by choice you know and uh, and i think the, 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 there there are uh, definitely possibilities in this thing so in that way this uh, farmer distress and uh, this thing it is it's 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 a, it's, it's a good thing you know because it is putting the focus back on the onto the thing yeah Uh, very quickly uh, to you too before we open it up but just one, one uh, sort of uh, um, clickbaity question to all of you as well that you know what does this mean in terms of uh, 2019 does it, is this really is a, is a dissatisfaction with the policy scenario right now in this new mobilization going to react impact uh, voting choices uh, particularly vis-a-vis uh, the the current government speculatively See, asking an anthropologist <laughs> this you're going to get some old ethnographic <laughs> story uh, which i'm going to now proceed to give you but uh, the thing is that so i mean taking off harish you know I, I, what i'd like to just make this one point that <clears throat> in order to actually make indian agriculture across given how regionally diverse it is and how extraordinarily dynamic it is even in crisis it is dynamic um is going to require a different imagination of what the role of the state and public investment is going to be even to encourage the kinds of um range of actors which includes a range of private actors both local and otherwise being involved right so i mean i'm just and, and to draw that argument back to the point that you're making so in my um, experience at least if i look little bit at madhya pradesh and a couple of the other states that i've looked at this question of what are the implications for the 2019 elections i think some of this has to do with the particular regional history of that of our states and their recent interactions with their own state governments because since agriculture is a state subject you see you know whether um, i mean farmers in madhya pradesh definitely attribute government to shivraj singh chauhan it, the credit does not go to national government 
about this. I mean, it is clearly an MP government thing, and this is because bonus after bonus has been put. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the uh, one of the very interesting things I would hear on the ground when I was an MP was that bonus used to change from year to year, even before this government came and then initially said no bonuses at all. But in the years that I started, you know, 2009, then one year it was 100, then it went down to 50, then it went to 150. And local people in the Mandi would always say, this depends on which election it is. And Shivraj Singh is playing a calculus. Oh, if it's a Vidhan Sabha election, it's a state election, he'll put 100 rupee bonus. When it's a Panchayat election, he'll put 100, 150 rupee bonus. But Lok Sabha election year, it was 50 rupees. Right? Knowing that the credit shouldn't go there anyway, it should be. So there's a very interesting game that politicians play when it comes to political calculus with their reforms. Um, and this is not a game that we need to think of terribly cynically because it is an electoral democracy and this is how these things get worked out. One of the very interesting, I want to give you two examples from MP. <clears throat> In the 1980s, this is a, something that Harish, un, has, having had to read my work, knows about, but still a lot of people don't. Uh, Digvijay Singh was the uh, agriculture minister uh, in Madhya Pradesh, and he launched a big campaign to get rid of the kacha artyas in Madhya Pradesh's mandis. You can imagine, uh, you know, for those who know both, I mean, Punjab, but many other mandis, UP, many other mandis across India, the Artya is a very critical figure. When I tell people that there are no Artyas in Harda Mandi, Kacha Artyas, people don't believe me. But I documented in great detail how these Artyas were removed in 1980s, you know, mid-1980s. This was an utterly political decision. It was about attacking the Banya base of the BJP. It was about bringing the Mandis into the state government's fold so that they can actually tax them better for revenue. It coincided with the soybean revolution, so it was the idea of actually, you know, getting soybean into the markets rather than letting it go out. So there was a very clear political calculus to it, but it was also one of the most uh, influential reforms. In the Mandi, they call it Krantikari, uh, from farmers and traders. Subsequently, many of the reforms that have been enabled in Madhya Pradesh have happened because of this reform. This was not a reform that farmers particularly supported because they were dependent on artyas for credit. It was very difficult for them to argue that you should remove artyas. But after the reform has been enacted, when I interviewed them, they would say, look at that artyas house where it used to be. Can you imagine we used to stand here for, you know, 100 rupees for hours? Right, so there was a very powerful solidarity that was produced later that farmers capitalized on. But in the moment, there was fear and suspicion of this reform. It was something that was very difficult for people to take on. Similarly, in 2008, when wheat procurement happened in Madhya Pradesh, this wasn't, I mean, farmers and MP, uh, the unions had been arguing for MSPs for a long time. But in Harda Mandi, at least no farmer had ever seen an MSP be actually secured till 2008. And from there till 2012, when Madhya Pradesh actually, you know, went and procured more than Haryana, right? This is from a base of zero procurement to that much. This was again something that had a strong political will. I think both Raman Singh and Shivraj Singh Chauhan saw the clear political calculus here uh, to make grain central. On one hand, it was PDS reforms, where he got known as Chawalwala Baba. On the other hand, it was, uh, you know, wheat procurement and these bonuses that were being provided year upon year. This is a Complex politics is the point that, you know, and it has very contradictory outcomes as well. So wheat procurement in Madhya Pradesh, I think, has made a huge impact on farmers, particularly because soybean at the same time has become much more vulnerable as a crop. So wheat became even more important to them in the last several years. But one of the things is that MP used to be known for its particular varieties of wheat. In places like Harda, those wheat varieties are no longer present. They have all been replaced by mill quality wheats. So, in fact, Harish used to give me lessons on all of help, uh, MPs Durham wheat. Many of those varieties are no longer there in the same places because it has moved to government procurement. Uh, pulses also, you know, there's a very cereal-centric thing. So this idea of increasing procurement to actually look at a range of other crops. There are ecological consequences, right? Farmers talk about electrification and the importance of electricity, but the big drive of groundwater extraction in Madhya Pradesh has come from small farmers. Groundwater drilling has really, you know, happened and expanded with small farmers. It's also the state which has a very vibrant watershed program. 
So there are alternative imaginations and alternative politics sort of working themselves out on the ground. So to see how this will translate into an electoral outcome requires us to actually understand what's happening in particular states at particular periods of time, who is able to claim electoral gain from it, but also to understand that these reforms are really very technically complicated. They are politically sensitive. They need alliances between large and small farmers. They need alliances between technical, you know, different kinds of technologies and knowledge, legal reform to happen at the same time, and understanding of how production, exchange, and consumption work together. Um, and, and so I really do think that this is a moment where we can actually look at some of those things, but we have to shift our focus to states. We have to shift our focus to regions to very location-specific solutions. I mean, we are now working across seven districts uh, in Punjab, Bihar, and, and uh, Odisha. And even within the district, we're seeing completely different stories. Uh, when it comes to procurement, in Punjab, you see a state, but you don't see the market in place. In Bihar, you know, it's all horticulturally driven. It's all the market without a state, you know, bolstering it with support. So, you know, we're going to have to, I think, really, you know, shift our focus a little bit uh, if we want to look at solutions on the ground for agriculture. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you. That was really fascinating.